Let's go into the word. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, uh, verse 18. I'll be reading to you from the New International Version. It reads like this. Uh, John's disciples told him about all, the, uh, all these things, calling two of them. He sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said... John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Verse 21, at that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases and sicknesses and evil spirits, uh, evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind received sight. The lame are walking. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Verse 23. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. He said, what did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind. If not... What did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who, he, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what, did you, but what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of a woman, there is none greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. For our Simonic Spotlight, I want you to take a look back at verse number 19. Verse 19, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we be looking for somebody else? Lord, thank you for this time we're going to share in your word. God, we will make room for you. We will make room for you because in your presence is the fullness of joy. So we'll make room for you, our honored guest today. God, I pray that you'll hide me behind the cross so that your people can only see you. God, I pray that you'll do for me now what I can't do for myself, and that is give me the ability to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ behind this sacred desk. God, I am a sinner, but I am a sinner saved by your grace. God, I pray that you'll forgive me of anything I said or did that will keep me from delivering this word to your people because, God, I want to deliver this meal with clean hands. God, I speak the name of Jesus into this room because your word says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So I speak the name of Jesus into this room and everything in here that's not like you just bowed in your presence. God, because you have the name that's above every name, so I speak the name of Jesus now. God, I pray that you'll guard these words from my mouth to their ears so that Satan won't come along and steal away the seed of the word that I know you want me to share today. God, I pray that there'll be less of me, but more of thee. God, less of me, but more of thee. God, less of me, but more of thee. No, God, let it be none of me, but all of thee. In Jesus' name, amen. As you take your seat, will you help me preach this? As you take your seat, we just look at somebody and say, when despair hits. When despair hits. Um, as we get ready to go into this fast on Wednesday, don't forget about the fast on Wednesday. I am dreading not being able to watch television because that is one of my ways of escaping. Uh, and, and I'm trying to figure out how to navigate the NCAA tournament and uh, and and I love Marvel movies and shows and they got some Moon Knight is coming out I'm like pastor why would you pick TV he could have picked any food group and I would have been okay with it but he chose television and he cut me right down to my heart y'all and I think it even cut itself because he said wait a minute I ain't gonna be able to watch TV either but I love watching TV and one time I was watching this show um, on reels uh, Michelle likes watching reels and uh, I was watching a show on Reels, and they were telling this story 
uh, these survival stories about people. And there was a husband and a wife, Rob and Angela Steiner, who were uh, telling this story about how they were driving down a uh, scenic highway in Tennessee. Uh, if you go from uh, Indianapolis to Cincinnati and then take 275 South around to 75 South, I go to Atlanta all the time, and you take 75 South down there, you'll actually, when you get into Tennessee, you'll be on Scenic Highway in Tennessee. And the reason why they call it Scenic Highway is because there's all these pull-off spots where you can, some of y'all nodding your heads so you've been down there, you can pull off and see the beautiful sights because you're on, you're on top of the mountain. And so they were driving through there uh, down Scenic Highway and Rob lost control of the car. And he hit a sheer rock wall on the side of the highway. He hit the wall. He then spun the car out. And they ended up in a ravine. Both of them sustained major injuries. They had to spend some time in the hospital. But Rob sustained head trauma. And he had amnesia. He had long-term amnesia. So after the accident, Angela recovered, Rob physically recovered, but mentally he could not remember who his wife was. He could not remember the times they shared together. He could not remember their honeymoon to Hawaii. He couldn't remember that they were high school sweethearts that got married in college, right after college, and that they had been married for 40 years. He couldn't remember her. And... The trauma of an incident, the trauma of a season, caused Rob to forget everything he ever knew about somebody he loves. And I wonder who I'm talking to in here, that you have dealt with trauma in your life, and it has caused you to not remember really, truly who God is. Because y'all can, you can sit there and act like that all you want, but I'll be honest with you, there are certain types of trauma that can cause you to not remember who God really is. Y'all so, man, I ain't never been through nothing. I've been through some things in my life, some, some levels of trauma that caused me to wonder, God, are you even real? And this is where John was in Luke chapter 7. John was uh, if to understand Luke chapter 7, what you really need to do is go to Luke chapter 1. Because in Luke chapter 1, Mary, the mother of Jesus, she goes and she tells her cousin Elizabeth that she is pregnant with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I just park there real quick? Because it bothers me when churches have an issue with women ministering, when the first person who literally carried the gospel was a woman. That's just for free. I didn't even say that at 8 o'clock. I just want to make sure I got that one out. That the first person who ever literally carried the gospel was a woman. God bless you. She walks into her cousin's house and she says, she says to her cousin Elizabeth, I have been overshadowed and I am pregnant with God. I am pregnant with Emmanuel, the God that will walk among us. And the Bible says that John the Baptist was in his mother's womb and started shouting over the sound of the name of Jesus. This is why it concerns me when people hear the name Jesus and something in you doesn't leap in your spirit. That troubles me when you hear the name Jesus and something doesn't shake you to your core. You want to know why? Because when hell hears the name Jesus, they tremble. Oh, y'all not going to say nothing to them. When you hear the name Jesus, it should do something to your spirit. John heard the name Jesus, and the Bible says that he started leaping in his mother's womb at the sound of the name of Jesus. If you continue following the story of John, <clears throat> what you also understand about John is that his father, Zechariah, was a priest in the temple. John not only leapt in his mother's womb at the sound of the name of Jesus, but then Zechariah, his father, brought him to church routinely to learn about God's word. Let me park again. This is why it's important that fathers lead worship in the home. It's important that fathers lead their family to church. Zachariah understood that there's something special about my boy. And if I want him to be a great man, I got to get him to church. That was another free one that I didn't give at the 8 o'clock service. I'm giving it to y'all. Zachariah would bring 
John to church with him, John understood scripture. He understood, he understood the prophecies about the coming Messiah. He understood the prophecies, watch this, about the prophet that would cry in the wilderness. And after a while, apparently, if I, if I can just assume this from the text, that over time, as John was growing up, God started dealing with John about his purpose. Because now the Bible doesn't say this, but I got to believe that at some point, God started speaking to John and say, hey, man, the dude you keep reading about in Old Testament scripture, that you keep reading about the prophets talking about the one that's going to cry in the wilderness, you are the guy. And at some point, John the Baptist accepted his call and went out into the wilderness. Let me park again. If God calls you to a ministry that's in the middle of a wilderness, you need to be willing to go to the wilderness. Ooh, y'all not going to say your man at all today. That's okay. So John goes out into the wilderness. He starts preaching. He starts preaching about the coming Messiah. The Bible says that John was such a respected preacher. He was such a great preacher that even the Pharisees and the Sadducees recognized him as the prophet crying in the wilderness. Now, if you know anything about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know that they routinely, and the scribes, you know they routinely followed Jesus around, player hating on every single daggone thing he did. They player hating on all of you don't like nothing I do. Y'all like nothing I do. Y'all like nothing I do. But for some reason, everybody respected John, even when they didn't respect Jesus. John was a great man. He was a great man. He knew the word of God. He preached the word of God. He would stand out in the wilderness. And you know you got to be a bad boy. You got to be a bad preacher when you stand out in the wilderness telling people about how raggedy they are and they still come to your church. That's a bad preacher right there. Because folk don't like to hear when they're wrong. But John was out in the wilderness saying, y'all need to repent. All of y'all need to repent. I need to repent. You need to repent. Repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. And he would always say, he would always say that I'm the one crying in the wilderness. I am, I am, I'm preparing the way for the, for the Messiah to come, for the master to come. And he would always tell them, listen, I baptize you with water unto repentance. But there's somebody coming after me. And he's going to baptize you with fire in the Holy Ghost. Are there any, are there any fire baptized people in this room? That you've been baptized in the spirit of God and baptized into the body of Christ. Ain't nobody got their hand lifted. I'm worried. Because you ought to rejoice because you have also been baptized into the body of Christ. John said, I'm only baptizing you unto repentance. But there's somebody coming after me. I'm not worthy to tie up his shoes. You got to understand in that time when they would walk through a dusty city that you get a little something on your feet if you understand what I'm saying. And it was not even appropriate for a slave to have to touch the feet of somebody. You touch your own feet, buddy. Because even, even though I work for you, you need to do that for yourself. John said, I'm not even worthy to do the job of a slave for him because he's so holy. John is a man of righteousness. He's a man of faith. He's a man of character. He is a respected man, and John is preaching. And then one day, as John is in the, uh, the River Jordan, there was this offshoot near Bethany that they would come into a smaller pool and baptize people, and John was in that pool, and Jesus came walking down into that pool near, uh, near Bethany, and when Jesus came down that hill, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. When Jesus showed up, John immediately recognized who Jesus was because he studied God's word. Can I encourage somebody in here? Can I, can I critique you on something that maybe you can't understand who God is? You won't get in his word. Because if you get in God's word, you'll recognize when God shows up. John spent time in the word of God. He spent time evangelizing people. So when Jesus showed up, John recognized Jesus when he saw him. So Jesus came down. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. And then Jesus says to John, he says, John, I need you to baptize me. John said, oh, no, 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 no. You baptize me. But then look what Jesus said. Jesus said, John, so that all righteousness can be fulfilled. I need you to baptize me. Because Jesus understood spiritual authority. And John was the bridge between the prophets and Jesus. John was the spiritual authority of that time.
And it teaches us a very important lesson about humility even in the church. Because it doesn't matter who you are, what position you hold. No, it doesn't matter what. It doesn't matter that you think that somebody is odd off in the wilderness with crazy clothes on, eating wild honey, and eating locusts. It doesn't matter. Sometimes the person who seems the craziest to you is the one who God has his hands on. Jesus said, so that all righteousness can be fulfilled. It wasn't a prophecy. Jesus didn't have to do that. Jesus respected John. He respected, here is the God man giving deference, giving due deference to John. He said, so that all righteousness can be fulfilled. It's only right, John, that you baptize me. And the Bible said that John consented to it. Because John was like, I don't agree with you, man. But I would, you, I, hey, man, you, the, hey, behold the lamb. I'll do whatever you say, man. I don't agree. It's the same thing that Peter did when Jesus said, let me wash your feet. Peter said, no, 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 no. I'll wash yours. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, Peter, you have no part of me. Peter said, well, listen, well, then dump the whole thing on me then. Just wash my whole body. John consented to Jesus so that all righteousness could be fulfilled. This is a unique, close relationship. Not only are they connected spiritually, but they are connected in respect. They are connected by blood. They are cousins, and there's a mutual respect here. I'm trying to paint the picture of why John was in such despair in Luke chapter 7. Because Jesus... All the things I've done for you, as close as we are, we are family. I have been preaching about you all of my adult life, telling people that you're coming. The Bible says that after John baptized Jesus, that the next day Jesus walked past the pool, the same pool, and John said, there he is, behold the Lamb of God. Why are y'all still here looking at me? There's the Lamb. And the Bible said that people left John's ministry to go follow Jesus. John said, I must decrease so that he can increase. This is a man of character. This is a man who serves God faithfully. This is a man who pays his tithes faithfully. This is a man who shows up to Bible study. This is a man who volunteers his time in ministry, serves with the usher, serves with the music department, serves with the deacon board, serves with the trustees, serves with outreach ministry, serves on the soul ministry. This John is a faithful member to God. But sometimes God will allow you to go through a hellish situation even though you've been faithful. And I know that is hard to hear. It is hard to hear that you could be so faithful to God and God would allow you to find yourself stuck in a prison somewhere. Because this is where John was when he sent these disciples to Jesus. I told you on a previous sermon before that John was arrested by Herod because he was preaching about, repent, he was preaching about, uh, he was preaching about Herod trying to sleep with his brother Philip's wife Herodias. And he said, I don't care who you are, Herod. You cannot have an extramarital affair with your brother's wife, man. You can't sleep with your brother's wife. And Herod was upset with that. Herod put him in prison. And this is where John is. Watch this while he's hearing about all the things that Jesus is doing for others. John is sitting in prison after he has done, he has prepared the way for the Lord. He has decreased so that he could increase. John has sent some of his disciples with Jesus. And here is John sitting in jail. And the reason why I'm in jail is because I've stood on your principles. And now I'm in jail and you're out healing people while I'm in here. Y'all not saying nothing in here. Look at verse 18. John's disciples told him all about these things, calling two of them. Verse 19, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one that is to come or should we look for somebody else? Let me help you understand why why, why John is frustrated. John has hit a season of despair. Because John, I told you that John spent years in the temple learning about the coming Messiah. But what he was taught, what they understood at that time, was that when the Messiah came, that he would deliver the kingdom back to Israel. 
they thought that he was going to be a military or a political leader that would lead them out of the oppression, lead them from underneath the oppression of the Romans and give them sovereignty in that area. So John is sitting in jail like, wait a minute, the God that I thought I knew, that I read about in scripture, you're supposed to be delivering the kingdom back. You're supposed to rule on earth. Well, why am I sitting in prison if you're supposed to be the one that should be able to deliver us? And let me make sure we're clear on something. That just because God isn't delivering you doesn't mean he's not a deliverer. This is a tough one today. This is a hard sermon today. Just because God isn't delivering you doesn't mean that he's not a deliverer. And if you're not careful, when despair hits you, you'll begin questioning God. If you're not careful, despair will cause you to question everything you ever thought you knew about God. I don't know why y'all looking at me like that. Have you not been in a situation in your life where you sitting there like, Lord, now wait a minute. I know for a fact you told me that I would be the head and not the tail. Well, why am I broke? Y'all not going to say amen in here. That's all right. Eat this. If you're not careful when you're in a season of despair, you'll think back over all the times that you came to choir rehearsal when it was snowing outside. All the times that you open the building up when, it, when all the rest of us are still sleeping in our beds, trustees are here opening up this building and warming it up and turning the lights on and shoveling the sidewalk. And if you're not careful, life has a way of putting you in a season of despair where you'll start questioning the very existence of God. Are you the one or should I be looking for somebody else? Are you the one or should I be looking to Islam? Y'all not going to say amen in here. Are you the one or should I be looking towards Scientology or Egyptology or Pan-Africanism or am I God myself? Are you the one or should I look for somebody else? Because despair, despair can cause you to question God. I got some questions for you, man. I got some questions for you. And it's not an indictment on your walk with God and who you are in God because you question sometimes. I just told you that John the Baptist was respected by everybody, even the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the scribes. He is a respectable man who knows God's word, who's been preaching about God all of his adult life. But life has a way. Life has a way of putting you in a box somewhere where you question everything you ever thought you knew about God. If you're not careful... Not only will despair cause you to question God, but despair will cause you to be offended with God. Let's keep reading. Verse 20, when, 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 the, when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or shall we look with someone else? At that very time, this is so funny to me, at that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. I'm sitting in jail and you out there blessing others. After all I've done for you, keep reading. Uh, so he replied to the messengers, verse 22, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Why is Jesus saying that? Jesus is saying that because these are the messianic signs of the Messiah. This is the work of the Christ. This is the work of the Messiah. You got to be careful that you don't make the same mistake John did. And that is that you assume that you know what God intends by something. And then when it manifests itself in a different way, now you're upset with God because you misunderstood what God's intentions were. I have children. They're sitting right over here. I've got children. And there are times that what they heard me say and what I said are different things. You cannot hold daddy accountable for you misunderstanding what I said I was going to do for you. Because I may have said something to you, but your childish mind, the mind of a child, hears it one way, but the father says it another. And if you're not careful, you'll fall into, and I don't care how much you know the word, because nobody in here knew the word like John the Baptist knew the word. And John the Baptist got to a point where he misunderstood God's word to a point where it put him in despair. Jesus said, no, 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 no. Go back and tell John that the, that the lame are walking. 
that the blind are seeing, that lepers are being healed, that the lame are walking. Why? Because Jesus was trying to remind John of what my word actually says. That I'm not going to deliver the kingdom here on earth in that way. I'm going to, I'm going to bring the kingdom of God to earth. John, in despair, if you're not careful, your despair will cause you to question God. Your despair will cause you to be offended with God. And look at verse number 23. Jesus says, this is how I know John was offended. Because Jesus, his discernment kicked in. Verse 23, he said, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on my account. You are blessed if you don't get offended at God because you misunderstood what God was saying to you. Oh, y'all not going to say it. This is a tough, I know it's tough. You are blessed if you don't get offended and shut down and stop coming to church and stop paying your tithes and stop coming to Sunday school and stop coming to Bible study and stop talking to God when you're at home. You are blessed when you understand that maybe I misunderstood what God was trying. Y'all going to sit there and look at me like, like you've always heard God the right way. Think about it. You married him and you thought the Lord was telling you to marry him, right? And then it didn't work. And then God said, I didn't tell you that. Y'all not going to say nothing in here. I'm by myself in here. I didn't tell you that. You went and bought a house that you couldn't afford, and the Lord is going to provide. I'm going to buy a $500,000 house when I can afford a $125,000 condo, and the Lord will provide. And the Lord said, no, you need to sell that house and get into one you can afford. Blessed is anyone who is not offended by me. If you're not careful, despair will cause you to question God. Despair will cause you to be offended by God. But here's the last one. This is what, this is what I love it. This is what I love about this text. That when despair hits, look how Jesus responds to John's despair. Watch with me. Work, walk with me. Verse 24. After John's messengers left, Jesus began speaking to the crowd. Watch this. About John. He said, what did you go into the wilderness to see? He said, what did you go into the wilderness to see? A, a reed swayed by the wind? If not, and I'm going to park there. He said, did y'all go out there to see a reed swaying back and forth in the wind? Somebody who is unstable because of their despair. That's not what y'all went out there to see. Because all of these people went out to see John preach all the time. And Jesus is saying, when you got out there, you didn't see somebody who was blowing all over the place, unsure of themselves and who they are. Look what he says. Verse 25, if not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. Verse 26, but what did you go to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet. Verse 27, this is the one whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Watch this. I tell you, among those who are born of a woman, there is no one greater than John. Wait a minute. John is questioning who God is. John is in the middle of despair. John is in the middle of hell. He's in his own personal hell in Herod's prison. And at any time, Herod can kick the door in and give him an execution order for him to be executed on the spot. He's sitting in despair. There's no end to it. He doesn't know when God is going to intervene. He doesn't know if God will intervene. He's in despair. He's questioning God and he's offended by God. But look how Jesus responds. He says, there's nobody ever born of a woman that's greater than John. Kendall, why are you telling me that? I'm telling you that because your despair doesn't change what God sees in you. Y'all don't know when to shout. John is in the middle of despair. He's questioning everything he ever thought he knew about God. He's questioning everything he ever thought about God. He is in despair and he's offended with God. But look how Jesus responds. He says, John, even though you have forgotten who I am, I have not forgotten who you are. That in the middle of your, in the middle of your hell, when you are throwing a hissy fit and you're throwing a temper tantrum with God and you're throwing yourself all over the place, telling God like 
a child in a grocery store. God, I thought you was going to do this for me. I thought you was going to do that for me. Here I am. My bills ain't paid. And my kid, my baby daddy, he won't help me. And while you're complaining to God, God is saying, but you're fearfully and wonderfully made. I know the thoughts I think towards you. Thoughts of good and out of evil to bring you to an expected end. I'm so glad that when despair hits, and even when I question God, and I'm offended with God, that God doesn't forget who I am. When you're in despair, your despair doesn't stop God's requirement of you to fulfill your purpose. Your despair and your anger with God does not stop you from still being required to meet the purpose that God has for your life. So somebody in here needs to get up. Get up out of that despair. After you get done with your questions, after you get done with your offense, remember who you are in God. Because God hasn't forgot who you are. He hasn't forgot what he promised you. He hasn't forgot what he said about you. You're in despair, but I ain't forgot. Oh, Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. In your despair, in your despair, in your despair, you start questioning, you get offended. Oh, but don't you ever for one moment think that God has forgotten who he said you are. Let me finish my story to tie this up. Let me finish my story about Rob and Angela Steiner. Because y'all know how I do. I leave you hanging and I, I, I'll fix it for you. As I was watching that show, the person interviewing Angela, he said, Angela, how difficult was it to love someone who couldn't remember you? How hard was it, Angela, to keep loving Rob when you could remember, but he couldn't? This is what she said, and I'm going to get out of here. She said, well, I, every day would remind him with something that we did in the past. She said, I would show him the pictures of our honeymoon. I would show him the pictures of our bike rides. I showed him the pictures of the time we went to the casino and lost money together and laughed, our, laughed all the way all night long because we had to borrow money to get back home when we were young. She said, I kept reminding him of all the things that we had done together. She said, and then after a while, she said, I did become a little discouraged because I never knew if he was going to remember me. She said, but after a while, they asked Rob, they said, well, they said, well, Rob, how was it for you? He said, I felt like I was trapped because I knew this woman loved me and my family was telling me that this woman loved me, but I couldn't remember. This is what Rob said, but one day, he said, one day after seven years, he said, one day after seven years, I suddenly remembered who I was. I remembered who my wife was. He said, I woke up in the morning and all of my memories came flooding back to my mind. He said, and the only reason I believe I was able to remember who my wife was is because she loved me through it. When I couldn't remember her, she remembered me. Is there anybody in here that's ever lost your mind and you started questioning God? You started wondering, God, are you who you say you are? You became offended with God, but through your temper tantrum, God chose to keep loving you, keep loving you. He kept on loving you until you could get your right mind back. And I'm so glad that God has the ability and a big enough heart to keep loving me even when I forget who he is, when I forget what he promised, when I forget what he said. God says to me, but I know who you are, so I will remember you i will remember us i will remember what we went through i remember the trips we took in life i remember when i raised you up i remember when i paid your bills i remember when i healed your body i remember when you were in despair and i brought you out and if you don't remember me i will love you until you remember me because i love you that much 
Well, I hope this experience has inspired you. But it's not enough just to be a hearer of the message. You also have to respond to it. And there's two ways to respond. First, you need to receive salvation. If you are not a believer, it is very simple to become one. I refer to it as the ABCs. Admit that you are a sinner. What does it mean to be a sinner? Well, it simply means that we've all done wrong and all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we do this on a regular basis. And the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. That literally means eternal separation from God. But God has given us a free gift and that gift is eternal life, which brings me to be, which is to believe. Believe in what Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Jesus took our place for sin. He took the punishment for our sins that we should have taken and he died, but he was raised from the grave. And if we believe that Jesus died and was raised back to life and put our whole heart and trust in that, then the next step, the letter C is to confess. Confess Jesus as Lord, which means that we are giving our life over to Christ that he will now be in control and he will be our Lord. And if you do those three things, admit, believe, and confess, you will become a Christian, a believer, a child of God. If you've already done that, then perhaps you need to become a part of a Christian fellowship. And you can do that virtually if you live in some other part of the country, or you can become a regular member of our church if you live in the city of Indianapolis. Here is what you need to do. There's information now on your screen, a phone number and an email address. Why don't you reach out to us and let us know about your decision to receive Christ or your desire to become a part of this fellowship and we will reach back out to you and get you connected. I again want to thank you so much for being a part of this experience and I hope you would join us again soon. Until then, be blessed.